All right. Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is the Sunday garden question and answer video that I do on Sundays. Uh, you can ask questions down below this video and I pick from those each week um, to answer. Uh, I think I've written down 22 or 23 uh, from a couple weeks ago, actually. Uh, this past week was a subscriber Sunday where uh, subscribers sent in photos of things in their yard that they were proud of. Uh, video was great. Thanks everyone for participating in that. I'll have another one soon. I'll announce it and uh, tell you how to send in the photos uh, for that sometime next month. Uh, we'll do that again. I've had a lot of uh, content going up here for a while now. I may have skipped a day by the time you see this, but I think I went on about a three-week run without skipping. And I have a ton of content uh, that I've shot, some great tours and other things that I'm um, just uh, trying to get all of the things in the ground here and things accomplished here for uh, summer. It's coming along. I think it looks looks pretty good uh, right now. Uh, not as much of a transition this year. Last year, because the shrubs were so small, after the spring flowering shrubs bloomed, there was a long period of time before the annuals kind of kicked in and took over. But this year, the shrubs are bigger and I've got more color throughout the garden with or without the summer flowers kicking in. So it uh, should be a good... Uh, should be a good season uh, out here and I'm shooting a weekly uh, tour video of it um, and uh, so uh, there'll be another one of those up probably probably Monday probably after you're seeing this question and answer so uh, let's get started on some questions from uh, the video from two weeks ago uh, somebody has a service berry and one of the main branches has died I guess they have a multi trunk one I have a single trunk service berry here that's been tree formed with you know single trunk I guess they have one that has five. They wanted to know when the best time to prune that dead branch off any time. doesn't matter um, if it's, uh, uh, just make sure you're using something sharp or use a good sharp um, uh, saw or something and make sure you make a, a good clean cut on it. Maybe make a bit of an angled cut so any water will um, pour off of it and, uh, uh, and, and kind of stay on the dry side. Don't cover it with anything though. Just make a, just make a good smooth cut at an angle. Uh, and, and again, anytime somebody uh, bought a boxwood and it has a clay root ball uh, in the in the in the pot. They want to put it into a pot and leave it in a pot for a while. Wondered if they should take the clay off of it. No, the clay is great for those uh, boxwoods. Obviously, it was a field grown boxwood, meaning the boxwood was grown in the ground in a in clay, uh, probably in the mountains of North Carolina or Tennessee, someplace like that. A lot of boxwoods are grown up there in the ground, and then they're dug up and transferred to containers or in or just in root balls in a uh, bald and burlap. Um, you know, wrapped in burlap, uh, you can buy them that way. But just no, just leave the clay on it, plant it into the new pot, and just tuck some other soil compost around it. Um, but that clay uh, contains a lot of the nutrients that the plant needs. It'll probably be better off in that clay than it would be in any kind of any kind of other potting soil. Okay, uh, somebody wanted to just asking a question in general about um, uh, frost damage or cold damage on camellias. Uh, on the flower buds, which is better to have to ensure that you have flowers. So like Camellia sasanquas um, and some of the hybrids bloom in the fall, like October, November, December, they're typically gonna be more reliably flowering because they will not have had as much cold, you know, they're typically not gonna get as much cold damage uh, before uh, Christmas time, January, early January is when the worst cold's gonna come. So most of your sasanquas would have finished blooming you know, and I have a lot of Camellia Sasanquas out here, but Camellia Japonicas are definitely, you know, they tend to have larger flowers. They tend to be, you know, what we think of when we think of Camellias. They are more susceptible to cold damage because the flower buds are getting, getting fatter during the month of, you know, and blooming in January, February, March, and into April. And so, um, you know, they are more susceptible to cold damage, especially as the buds swell you know, when the buds are tight on them, they're very, very cold hardy. But at, once they start that swelling process uh, to open up, they are more vulnerable to cold. But some people, I mean, I, I sold camellias. I grew, gosh, I don't know how many camellias I grew. I grew camellias for a lot of other nurseries, actually, uh, rooted, rooted cuttings and one-gallon containers. Uh, there were a lot of people in the South that just don't consider Camellia sasanquas even to be camellias. You know, they only consider Camellia japonicas. They're the real camellias. I would have... You know, I'd have somebody come into my space at the farmer's market or, or the garden center and go, oh, all you have is Sasanquas. We were looking for camellias. <laughs> you know, that would, that would be what it is. They didn't, you know, they don't even consider Sasanquas camellias. So they tend to have smaller flowers. They tend to be 
you know, more shrubby, you know, not as, tr you know, big and, you know, uh, uh, you know, with the big, large flowers and that kind of thing. So Camellia sasanquas are less Camellia-y, but more hardy for sure. Uh, but the buds are, the, they're more reliable flowering. That's what I'll say. But it was always, that was always a really funny conversation to have. All you have is sasanquas. You don't have, you don't have real Camellias then. Um, so, but Camellia, I, I would have both. Uh, there's some, this was a great Camellia japonica year uh, in my area. It's, it got cold for a long enough period of time that it kept them dormant until we passed the worst of the cold and then they opened up beautifully. Okay, um, somebody asked if Caria japonica is invasive. Uh, they're in Greensboro, North Carolina and wanted to buy one and read they were invasive. Yeah, Car Caria japonica is considered uh, an invasive. It's a yellow flowering shrub, blooms early in the season. Most of them most of the carry is past uh, flower at this point in my area. If you're in colder areas, they might just be flowering. Uh, but Caria japonica pleniflora, the double flowering variety, is not considered invasive, and it's a it's a probably a prettier plant uh, just in general. Caria is another one of those plants like um, forsythia that needs to be left to grow. Uh, don't put it somewhere where you're going to have to try to keep it as a three foot or four foot little ball, and you have to prune it all the time. Put it in a place where you can let it become an arching 10 foot uh, plant. Um, they're, you know, they're beautiful that way, but uh, Pleniflora is considered non-invasive. It, it's the double flowering form. Okay, um, let's see. Oh, somebody had part of their oak leaf hydrangea um, broke off, wanted to know if they can root, um, can root it. Yeah, they root um, fairly easy. There are um, other other hydrangeas are actually easier to root than oak leaf hydrangeas, but oak leaf hydrangeas aren't that hard to root. You can just put them in some soil and, you know, put some sort of plastic bag or container over top of it to keep it moist. Take that, take it off occasionally just to get some air uh, in it. And they root reasonably well, on, especially on new growth uh, here in the uh, early spring as they're leafing out. But hydrangea paniculatas are probably the easiest to root. Um, and then um, hydrangea macrophyllas are easy to root as well, but the big leaves sometimes make it just a pain um, to root a bunch of them together because if the leaves overlap on them while you're trying to root them, they cause, ca cause issues. Um, oak leaf hydrangea is probably the bottom, of the, the, the hardest to root, but they're not hard to root. They're just harder than other hydrangeas to root, but I, I rooted thousands and thousands of oak leaf hydrangeas every summer and uh, uh, never had any problem, never had any problem with them. Um, Somebody get, uh, bought some melon podium seed and it's not germinating. Um, wanted to know if it was difficult to germinate. Um, no, melon podium is usually pretty easy. It's not the fastest thing to germinate. It's a little small yellow flowering annual. It gets quite seedy in the ground. So once you do germinate your melon podium seed, you're gonna have melon podium every year. Um, and I, I do use it in my annuals bed out front. Um, I like it a lot. And some of, the, some of the seedlings will come up from the previous year, but they're easy, to, they're easy to take out as they're germinating in the spring. At this point, I'd probably try to direct seed it in the ground. It actually, direct seeds in the ground may be even e easier than inside. Uh, so that's what I would do. But usually it takes about two weeks for it to germinate. But it's, um, I don't know if you got bad seed. You know, that's within the realm of possibility that the seed is old or something like that, because generally speaking, slow but easy uh, to germinate. And at this point, I would just put them out directly, just direct seed them. They'll come up. Uh, let's see. Somebody won't say shade loving. I, lo I always love this shade loving screening plant. No plant really loves the deep shade. Uh, even the plants that evolved in the shade and are tolerant of shade. Uh, they're all still racing to go up into the canopy to get sunlight. You know, all the vines that are shade loving vines are climbing on the trees trying to get up into the sunlight. Um, I don't know that anything really, really loves the shade. It evolved to tolerate um, the shade and adapted uh, to, uh, to the shade uh, with either larger leaves or something like that. Anyway, just throwing that out there. Uh, Shindo viburnum is probably a good uh, choice. Um, I don't know, that, again, it's not shade loving, but anytime I see a Shindo viburnum growing in a shady space, they're typically still very full, you know, where a lot of other plants stretch uh, and are thin. So I'd put that on my list, but don't go out and plant 75 Shindo viburnums. Um, you know, you can mix in some Elysium, which I have here. Um, you know, there, there are hollies, like American hollies, um, you know, that are, that are pretty shade tolerant. Uh, a mixture of things is best. But if you just like one or two plants needed, Shindo viburnum would work great. 
Uh, somebody asked about um, how to prevent their onions from bolting. We have a very short onion and garlic season here in the southeast. And when we go right from, we've already had two days in the 90s and I can already see my garlic is, you know, um, wanting to be done. And some of my other uh, cool season vegetables are bolting already. Most of the onion onions are grown in the Pacific Northwest for a reason. It just doesn't get that hot and it doesn't get that cold. So they don't have to protect them from either. Uh, you know, in Washington and Idaho and, and those places where most of commercial onions are grown. Um, you know, having the roots, you know, ha having the, ha make, make sure you're watering those types of vegetables if it gets dry, because if they get the heat and dry at the same time, so make sure, you, make sure your onions have, keep a cover available uh, to keep them from being too cold on you know, extremely cold nights. And then also you can put a, you could put some sort of shade protection over them on days that are in the 90s and then make sure they're well watered uh, when it's uh, hot. But they're going to bolt quicker here in the southeast. Uh, they just are. Bolting just means they're going to flower. Once they flower, the bulb starts producing, stops producing size. Somebody wants a Rub, uh, Ruby Spice Clethra update. Um, I'll put that in the uh, tour video this week. Um, I've got three uh, Clethra in the uh, front garden. I'll show you. They look great. Somebody said I have to mention Lorapetalum apparently in every one of these Q&As, so I'm saying the word Lorapetalum. Uh, <laughs> just <laughs> apparently, yes. It always comes up. I'm usually sitting over here and that Lorapetalum's behind me. And somebody asked, even in this one, I get that same question. Uh, what is that purple plant behind you? It's a Laura, Laura Petalum. Okay, Chinese fringe flower is the common name for it. Um, uh, somebody asked, when is the best time to move a spirea? It was a candy corn spirea. It probably doesn't matter. You can probably park your car on your spirea um, and not hurt it. So anytime you want to. Most of those spireas are starting to bloom now. And so having them in flower when you're moving them is probably more stressful than not. So you might want to you know, if you wanted to move it tomorrow, you could, but I would take the flower buds off of them and some of that new growth off of them and just move them. Uh, you, you're not going to hurt them, but if they're actively growing, producing flowers, producing lots of leaves, which they likely are right now, uh, some of that needs to be reduced uh, to move them um, without that much stress on the plant. But even if you didn't prune them back and they wilted for five days and they dropped every leaf, they'd probably come right back out. It's a spirea. Um, Let's see, uh, somebody asked, oh, they got their alliums too close. Can you see my purple alliums here? I think you can. Uh, there's alliums are too close together and they wanted to know when would be a good time to uh, move them. Wait till they're finished flowering and that foliage is dying back, which the foliage starts to die back while they're in flower. It's one of the problems, one of the weird things with alliums. I wish the foliage stayed better looking while they were in flower, but, uh, Wait till after that foliage is almost completely died back and then transplant them and space them further apart. Uh, let's see. Um, somebody wanted to know what grows faster, a limelight hydrangea or a Chinese snowball viburnum. Uh, limelight hydrangea. Hydrangea paniculatas grow very, very fast. In fact, my white wedding hydrangeas have leafed out and already grown about 18 inches uh, since they leafed out. So very fast. My Chinese snowball was a one gallon last year and it's maybe put on about six inches of growth versus, so the panic, hydrangea paniculata is going to be faster. Um, I probably prefer the Chinese snowball, um, honestly. Um, it blooms uh, spring and blooms fall. And uh, to me, it's just more of an interesting, an interesting plant. Um, there's so many hydrangea paniculatas everywhere. Um, let's see. Uh, but everybody loves their limelight hydrangeas. I understand that. Um, somebody asked me if they needed to replace the soil in their containers. That's another video you're going to see this week. Do you need to replace the soil in your containers every year? I don't think you need to replace the soil in your containers every year, but I usually will dig out a little bit of the soil every year and put some fresh soil in there. So, you know, let's say I replace uh, a quarter to a third of the soil every year when I replace um, or put new things into those pots, but I don't replace all of the soil. Um, I don't want to spend that money uh, and uh, it, it seems unnecessary. Okay, somebody asked me how to propagate their bleeding hearts and their Jacob's Ladder, both of which were in bloom and looking great this year. Both of those, bleeding hearts and Jacob's Ladder, can be produced by cuttings. So you can take soft wood cuttings on them right now and root them in soil and have some sort of mist on them uh, or keep them covered in some sort of little plastic dome. 
vent the dome a bit. Um, I, I should have said that with that oak leaf hydrangea. You want some sort of small holes if you're covering it in plastic. Otherwise, it keeps it too wet. Uh, you need some sort of ventilation out of a plastic dome. Um, you, so you can take cuttings. You can collect seed after they finish flowering, and that seed readily germinates on both of those. And you can do division. Uh, so, you know, um, not many plants like that, but Bleeding Hearts and Jacob's Ladder. Cuttings, seed, or division, uh, all three. Uh, your, your choice. You can dig them up and chop them up um, if you want to. Okay. Are part shade and part sun the same thing? Somebody asked a question. They had some um, bright light in the middle of the day, but overall the space was shady. Um, but it's a good question about part shade and part sun being the same thing. Technically, yes, they're the same thing, but you, what you'll see on a tag that says part sun is it'll be sun to part sun. And on a part shade tag, typically you're going to see shade to part shade. And why is that significant? Probably if the tag says sun to part sun, they're really saying it needs to lean towards some direct sun. Okay. The words overall mean the same thing. It's just that, that it's the part sun tends to be connected to the word sun uh, on the tag, as opposed to the part shade being connected to the word shade. And so part shade plants are probably going to have be better in the you know in in shadier conditions with less direct sun uh, so there technically no there's no difference between them but when we when we're, when we're using the words it, it tends to be attached to either sun or shade and so you can look at that plant and say it kind of leans toward you know one a little more than the other and it probably need if it says part sun it probably and it says sun to part sun it probably needs some direct sun uh, if it says part shade to shade, it probably doesn't need any direct sun, but probably needs good bright light. Um, uh, that's one thing you'll see in some of these tour videos that I do. You'll see an intermix of shade and sun plants. Um, high shade uh, is probably the absolute best growing conditions uh, for, for, to allow you to grow sun plants and shade plants in kind of the same intermixed uh, space. And so... I'm kind of able to do that in this garden. Things that you would think are more shade loving or things you think were more sun loving because I got a big oak back here that's limbed way, way, way up. Uh, so it's really, really bright. There's direct sun coming in here for part of the day, but it's not all day and I'm able to do both. Um, but yeah, there's no different. Technically, there's nothing, no difference between them. But again, just kind of reading in between the lines. You know, if it's on this, if it's, you know, sun to part sun, Part shade to shade, you know, prob probably needs some direct sun in the part, the part sun. Okay, uh, let's see. Somebody um, has hydrophobic soil and they've got a, um, uh, a, lawn, um, a centipede lawn, which is a type of warm season grass. We, in the south, we, you know, we have zoysia, centipede, bermuda, which is, you know, the worst. Um, and... Um, uh, we, grasses that go dormant in the winter time, whereas wherever you're watching from, you might have fescues and blue grasses and um, uh, uh, rye grasses and, and that, that, that kind of thing. Uh, but our warm season, they have centipede lawn in eastern South Carolina and the sod is not doing well because they have hydrophobic soil. What hydrophobic soil is, is soil that won't allow water to penetrate it. So rains on it and just washes right off. It can be caused by a lot of different things. It can be caused because it stays dry and so they have no microbial activity in the soil. So there's no bacteria, no, um, um, you know, no, 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 no fungi doing work in the soil, no earthworms, none of those, none of those kinds of things are happening. And so the soil just becomes really super compact. Fire can cause it. You can have fire. You can have a lot of different reasons why soil won't take on water. Uh, if I had that type of soil, I probably would have at first, before the sod went out, I probably would have covered something like that in 12 inches of wood chips and let them set there for two, you know a year and break down and really kind of tr figure out a way to change that soil, you know, get earthworms moving through it and that kind of thing. Once you've rolled the sod out on top of it, I think you're going to probably have to use an aerator and punch some holes in it, punch some deep holes in it if you can. Uh, maybe uh, put some put some sort of sand or compost over it after you do that and let some of that get down into the ground. Uh, you can try humic acid. That was in their question. Um, but again, um, 
the other areas that they have their beds and in, in the question they said they had put down compost and and uh hardwood mulch and those kinds of things so those beds are going to improve really hard to improve your soil or your your turf once you've already put the sod down but again if i could back up time i would have just buried that whole area in wood chips or or some or some organic material for some period of time and let it come back to you know come back to life and then and then at that point um you could have sodded it or, or whatever but again punch holes in it some way or another mechanically and then get some compost uh, and rake it in get you one of those wide rakes and see if you can rake some of that into those holes um, but hydrophobic soils are tough uh, and interesting interesting at, at the same time somebody bought a dogwood prematurely they're two years from being able to put it where they want to want to put it can they keep it in the container yes but you probably want to step the container up a couple times over the course of two years um, uh, in a uh, in a container nursery I, I grew plants in containers for years you know we don't keep anything in a container more than about 12 months before it's into a larger container uh, and 12 months is probably on the long side i mean probably eight to nine months before something gets stepped up so you'll either want to pull it out of the existing container and knock some soil off put some fresh soil on it just like that other question that was asked earlier or pot it up into a slightly larger container a couple times during that two-year period uh, somebody asked about removing knockout roses without getting hurt in the process i just cut them down to the ground get some long bypass pruners so that you can just reach right down into the bottom of the plant cut them off right at the base and then dig it out with a shovel you don't even have to you know you're still going to need gloves to pick up those long pieces of roses but don't definitely don't get in there and start even if you were transplanting them that's the way i would transplant them i'd cut them down to about 12 inches high and then dig them out and move them. You don't have to take all that foliage and the rest of the plant with you, even to transplant them. Uh, they'll just come right back from that, um, unless they have rose rosette. Um, let's see, uh, somebody asked me if dyed mulches break down as easily as other mulches. Uh, if it was dyed hard, if it was, if it was the same types of material, um, yes. If, you know, if it was my, like my triple shredded hardwood had been dyed black or brown, yes, they would break down at the same rate. Most of that dyed mulch though I see is wood. I mean, it's just, it's just chunks, it's just pieces of wood from either chipped up pallets. Um, and I wanna know what was on those pallets. That's always the question I have in my mind is what was on those pallets? Was it, uh, you know, what was being transported on those pallets? Was it spilled on them? You know, I have, you know, I always have that question about chipped up pallets being used as mulch maybe there's nothing on them i have no idea but so that's just a, it's a complete normally it's a completely different material i think they're taking an inferior product and dyeing it and um to cover up the fact that it's a weird product in the first place it's just it's it's not even like wood chips like where it was living you know like it got it was a tree that got cut down and chipped and then was brought to your house where it still has some of that um fluid in it and all, you know the the, st the stuff that can break down and really get going it's old wood that was chipped up and dried out um and so it seems to number one it floats everywhere i see it in commercial settings it's out on the sidewalk and it's you know it's a mess um it doesn't seem to break down uh very well at all and i'm not talking about because it was dyed that has nothing to do with it it's the material itself that they're dying um and, and you know and, and selling um it just seems like a strange it seems like a strange product that doesn't break down uh that easily so the hard the, the triple shredded hardwood that i use or compost or wood chips that are delivered right off a job site where they were cutting the tree down all of that stuff seems to break down super quick i don't see that stuff breaking down they're in an hoa that requires black mulch can you imagine <laughs> An entire subdivision of black mulch <laughs> that is so oh my gosh what a strange world we live in um, where you know people would be that worried about everybody else's business that you know they would require their neighbors to use black mulch uh, what a strange world um okay so somebody asked about how do you mulch around ground covers um you can put little pots over them and then mulch and then pull the pots off and let the mulch fill in uh, I've used that technique on jobs in the past where somebody had a, like, let's say they had 150 liriope that I had to mulch around. We just turn pots upside down on them and then mulch, and then you can pull the pots off and the mulch can fall into place. 
their concern was if you mulch really close up to the ground cover, would the ground cover still be able to fill in as easily? No, not as easily, but it won't have any problem. My fear is if you don't mulch up close to them, you're gonna get weeds all around them, which is gonna prevent them from spreading as well. So um, I would mulch right up to them. The ground covers will probably spread slightly slower, you know, through the mulch than they would on bare soil um, or just compost or something like that. Uh, but uh, I don't want the weeds, so I'm gonna mulch right up to them. Um, let's see, I'm gonna end this. Um, with uh, uh, something about pushing plants. Um, I've, I've said several times in videos uh, about um, if, you push, if you push your plants too fast, you end up with insect uh, and disease problems. And somebody wanted to know why that was. For, uh, I've escaped answering this question uh, for a long time, but I've said it many, many times that I use organic fertilizers because I'm trying to feed the soil, let the soil feed the plants. That's how nature operates. Nobody's out here fertilizing the woods. So how is it those plants are managing to survive without us? You know, um, uh, and the way they're managing to survive without us is there are beneficial bacteria and beneficial fungi under that soil that are in charge of bringing, um, bringing that plant the nutrients it needs at the time it needs them. Okay, this is the key, this is the key to the kingdom, okay? The plant needs what it needs when it needs it, okay? It's the same as any other living creature. You know, is calcium good for a human? Yeah, we need it. We don't need a million times more than we need, though, <laughs> okay? Uh, it can go, we can go from beneficial to us to, um, to bad for us. Any nutrient can. You know, there, there's a, there, you know, we need them, but we don't need them so much that it causes some other problem or some sort of other imbalance. So the plants... Animals, everything need nutrients when they need nutrients. And so they all have formed relationships either with beneficial bacteria or beneficial fungi. And basically the tree sends a signal, says, I need more phosphorus. Okay, I need more potassium. I need more boron. I need more whatever. There's a lot of nutrients we're talking about here. Probably more than humans even know. Um, and so at way out from the actual root system, the plant, the, the, these beneficial things can bring the plant water, it can bring the plant nutrients. In exchange for that, the plant provides simple sugars that it makes from sunlight, okay? So the plant's using the sun's energy to produce simple sugars, to produce sugars that it feeds, can feed these beneficial bacteria and these beneficial um, uh, fungi. And so this is the relationship they have with one another. This is, how the, this is how it works. There's more life under the soil than there is above the soil. And these two things are working together. So that the tree says, I need this now, I need calcium. And so it's supplied when it needs it. If you take an inorganic fertilizer and feed the plant directly, okay, it puts this, it basically says, here's nitrogen. Okay, here's nitrogen and you're gonna have to use it because it's sitting there and it's already in a form that you can take it up and the plant will do it and it'll start growing and it'll start growing faster. And to us as humans, the plant looks healthy, okay? But <laughs> because it's big and green, right? Because green and, green and fast growing must mean healthy, right? Okay, but you can't look, just like you can't look at a human and tell whether they're, you know, they have some sort of disease or some sort of problem necessarily. Um, this is the same thing in a plant. The plant being green and growing fast does not mean that the nutrients in that plant are balanced properly. Okay, this is what we're talking about here. So what we wanna do is feed the soil and let the soil and let those beneficials in the soil and the relationship that that plant has with those things decide when it needs uh, any particular nutrient. So, um, you know, just like a human can be suffering from, from inflammation and have pain, you can't look at them and see it, right? That per, you know, a person may look perfectly healthy. You know, they may have jogged past you. And they may be just, you know, have inflammation and pain. That plant is, infl is inflamed as well. You just can't see it. Holly decided to join me. Most of our chewing, sucking insects or things like mites are on the planet to actually, uh, uh, almost, uh, mites especially are on, on the planet to eliminate sick plants. So to take out plants that are, that, that seem inferior. Um, and they're actually doing all the other plants a favor by not allowing this plant to produce seed and to reproduce itself. 
and so they're being eliminated. Um, so that's what you need to think of when you're thinking about a lot of these small chewing insects. Um, uh, they're on that plant because it's actually in a weakened state, a weakened state that you can't see, okay? You, you know, you're pushing the plant with whatever inorganic fertilizer, I'm not gonna mention any brands, um, I don't need to be sued. Um, but if you're pushing the plant, pushing the plant, pushing the plant, and you're seeing these insect problems, and I see, you know, there's videos on YouTube, you know, let's fertilize it every week. You gotta fertilize it every week. Here's the special fertilizer, fertilize it every week. And then three weeks later, here's how you take care of budworms. Here's how you take care of this. Here's how you take care. Well, those two things are related. So the thing I've held back on, one of the things I've held back on this channel um, is I spent a, a few years, a couple years doing organic lawn care. Um, and one of the things that we were working on in landscaping and uh, doing, doing lawn care organically was measuring the sugars that are in the plant. So uh, if you have really high sugars in the plant, it usually generally relates to the plant's health. And this is a, this tool is called a refractometer. You put a small amount of, um, you squeeze, basically squeeze the juice out of a leaf, a flower, a fruit, anything onto this and look, look down it and you measure uh, what's called a bricks reading. And it's the amount of sugar uh, that's in uh, that leaf or that blade of grass or that fruit. Um, uh, wineries use this to measure their grapes. Um, uh, brewmasters use a refractometer to measure sugars in their brew beer brewing. Um, it's used to decide when to pick fruit, um, all kinds of things this tool is actually used for. What I use it for in the garden is uh, I, can, um, I can take a bricks reading uh, and know if a plant is is in a healthy state. If I can get a bricks reading over 10, 11, 12, higher than 12, that plant's almost invincible to, um, not invincible, but it's very resistant to insect and disease problems. Um, if it's very, very low, um, that plant's very vulnerable uh, to, uh, to insect issues. And so I've been using this refractometer uh, my entire time in this business. And what I know is if we improve the soil and we just get the nutrients in place and allow this natural relationship to take place. So the plant says, I need whatever nutrient, and those things make it available for them. It keeps the plant in the proper balance. It gets that thing when it asks, actually asks for it, and I can get my bricks readings higher. The higher that I get my, the higher the, higher the number, with this little simple tool, um, the more resistant my plants are to insect and diseases. So if you come through here, uh, you will find virtually no, uh, uh, and it's not, but I'm not hiding any, it's no secret. I, you know, I haven't talked about the fact that I'm measuring uh, this to see that I'm, you know, I tried this in the nursery business as well. It's the, the impossibility is that in a container nursery or when container gardening, you can never get all the containers exactly the same. So it won't work. And all the plants need to look the same. People come to buy 12 hollies. They want all 12 hollies to look alike. So I had, you, you have to, you have to take a different approach in a container nursery, but in the ground, like this, um, simply keeping the ground covered with organic material, keeping the stuff breaking down constantly, and occasionally giving it a small amount of organic fertilizers, keeps my bricks readings way up. It's super simple. It's actually less work, <laughs> uh, you know? Uh, and so that's the way I do it. So that, there's, my, there's the reason why inorganic fertilizers. Inorganic fertilizers cause imbalances in the plant. Those imbalances, although to our to human eyes, we can't see imbalances. Insects can, they pick up on it. Uh, and they're there to actually, um, th the plant's in a weakened state and it allows them to, t advantageous insects to take advantage of that. Or in the case of mites, I think mites are on the planet to literally eliminate that plant completely, take it out so that it doesn't uh, continue. You notice that in your house, you'll get mites on your house plants. Well, a lot of times that's because the, the, the plant's in very low light in your house. And because it's in such low light, it's in bad shape and it sends off signals and the mites come and they're there to destroy it. Uh, that's what they're there for. So anyway, hopefully that's not overly, um, overly complicated, but a refractometer is the tool I use to measure the sugars in plants. The higher I can get the readings, um, the higher I can get the bricks readings, the more resistant my plants are to uh, insect uh, and disease problems. And uh, uh, 
there you go. Uh, thank you guys for following along. Ask gardening questions down below, and I'll be back uh, next week with uh, more qu more questions. Thanks. <laughs>